May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You know, I'm not the first rector of Church of the Holy Spirit because we were a mission church from Truro Church. And for the first few years, Martin Minns was our rector. And uh, his wife is named Angela. And uh, this is Angela's picture here on the screen. <coughs> and uh, Angela is awesome. She's uh, from England. And every morning, uh, <coughs> for as long as her children were at home, she always used to tell her children the same thing at the breakfast table every morning. Some of you who know Angela know what I'm about to say. She always said to them, <coughs> remember who you are. Every morning, until they grew up and left home, they heard from their mama at the breakfast table when they were leaving, remember who you are. So, <clears throat> who are you? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 says this about us, and I paraphrase, I am adopted into God's family and accepted in the beloved. Let's say that together. I'm adopted into God's family and accepted in the beloved. You see, when you know you're accepted in the family, when you know you're loved with a forever kind of love, you can be set free. You can be set free from fear and anxiety for all your earthly days. This is the truth about following Christ. We are adopted and accepted in the beloved. Can I hear an amen? This is the first message that I'm going to be preaching in a series uh, walking through <clears throat> uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now, Paul wrote this letter about three decades after Christ's crucifixion. Ephesus is located, if you'd have the next slide, please, um, in western Turkey on the, Aege the coast of the Aegean Sea. It's a lovely seaside uh, location. And the ruins are still there today. You can go and, and look at them. It was a, uh, of course, today it's, it's in Turkey, but at that time it was a Greek city. And it was the fourth largest city in the world at that time, which housed what many people think was probably the world's largest slave market, among other things. It was also uh, located, um, also located in Ephesus, was the temple of Artemis, also known in Roman mythology as Diana. And that's a picture, a model of, of the temple of uh, Artemis. This was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the reason is because not only is it lovely, it's also massive. This thing is as large as a football field. At the time, it was the largest building in the world. Okay. And look at those marble pillars. Uh, pretty impressive, eh? Now, Paul arrived in Ephesus around 53 AD, and he began preaching about the grace of God and sending Jesus. He stayed there for about two years, then he left. And, uh, of course, he, he planted a church there, and uh, these, these new, this new ragtag band of believers in, in Ephesus, they uh, tried to get along without him, but... Uh, you know, Paul heard back from them, and so he uh, found out what was happening, and so he wrote a letter to them to encourage them in what, about what it means to be followers of the way, what it is to be the church, the ecclesia, the, the called out ones. So this letter is really primarily about the church. <clears throat> the first three chapters are very theological. It's about who we are in Christ it's about our identity in him. The last three chapters are very practical. It's about how we're to behave now that we know who we are. Paul's order is very intentional. Beloved, I want you to listen to me right now. This is important. In the community of Jesus, you belong before you believe. Okay? You can belong, you do belong, sorry, before you behave. Listen to me. Hmm. You belong before you behave. You can belong before you behave. You, you do belong before you behave. Okay? It's not about behavior. Church is not about behavior modification. Can I hear an amen? amen. 
It's really not. It's about knowing who we are in Christ. And once we know who we are in Christ, then the behavior follows. <clears throat> a good friend of mine is named Tom Herrick, and he grew up in a church in Cleveland. And uh, for him, church as a young boy was an experience of being uh, like a lot of hyperactive little kids. He was very squirmy in his chair, in, in his pew at church. And so he remembers very clearly once uh, him <clears throat> not doing what his mama wanted him to do. So his mother took his ear and twisted it. That's his memory of church. Okay, so for him, you understand, church was about a place where you go where you have to behave. Are you hear me? Do you hear me? That, that's not what church is. It's not, it's not about behaving. That's not, that's not primarily what we're about here. It's about um, believing. It's about knowing your identity. You belong before you're expected to behave. You know what? That's good news. Can I hear an amen? amen. It really is. Okay, uh, we have a, uh, I've got a sermon uh, outline insert in your bulletin, so I encourage you to open up your bulletin, pull out your insert, and follow along, and fill in the blanks there. Point number one on your bulletin, <coughs> our identity is not to be in the things of this world. Our identity is not to be in the things of this world. Now, <coughs> here in the D.C. area, when you meet someone for the first time, what's the first question that they ask you? What do you do, right? Why do you think that is? Well, you see, um, in, in D.C., you know, it's, it's all about power. It's all about job. It's all about money. It's all about position. And that's, that's the sort of the reigning spiritual principality of this place, all right? And they want to know what you do. It's not just here, of course. It's all over the place. But they want to know what you do because that's the way they identify you. They, now they have a peg for you. Now they got a box for you. Now they know something important about you. And so here's, here's the danger. The danger is we can begin to think we are what we do. What our job is defines us or lack thereof. Okay? You know, there's a, there's a lot of problems in trying to find your identity in your work, whether it's paid work or unpaid work. Um, I'm, looking, I'm looking at Jessica right now thinking, oh, that woman works, trust me. <laughs> Full-time mom, homeschooling, oh, that's work. <clears throat> uh, the problem is, you know, that markets move and they shift. You know, work changes. Um, but we are not our work. That's not who we are. You remember the silversmiths in Ephesus. In the book of Acts, talks about Paul's missionary journey. Um, he, he shows up in, uh, in Ephesus, uh, and um, he preaches about Jesus Christ uh, resurrected. And he also, because remember, this is home of Artemis, right? He also preaches against idolatry. And the silversmiths have this great business of making idol statues of Artemis, the goddess of hunt and of wild animals. And uh, so Paul says, you know, you got to get rid of those, right, immediately, right off the bat. That's what he says. And so what happens? There's an uproar. Remember, there's a riot. And the people are saying, uh, the silversmiths are saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Remember? Okay. So uh, the thing is, they were finding their identity that they were a part of this great temple cult of Artemis. But not only that, they found their identity in their work. They didn't want anybody to mess with their livelihood of making these silver idols. You know, our work isn't secure. Eventually, Ephesus came a became a thoroughly Christian town. <laughs> And uh, those, those silversmiths were out of work. They, couldn't, they had to do something else. Maybe they had to make crosses now. I don't know. Uh, but, <coughs> you know, I, uh, for, for many years, I was an attorney practicing in the area, and I used to work at Freddie Mac in Tyson's Corner. And we used to have a kind of a, uh, an inside joke, you know. <laughs> um, it's, um, we, we would say, uh-oh, I can feel it. Reorg time is just around the corner. You know what I'm talking about. Those of you who work in large corporations, well, at the time, it seemed like every two years or so, like clockwork, there was another reorganization where, you know, the, the, 
the org chart was moved around and people were reclassified from one description to another and you know they wanted to align everybody to make sure that the, the that the pay was right and you know at one point they cut my benefits because you know they didn't they thought the lawyers were getting too many stock options i mean it's crazy right nothing is secure in corporate life if we base our identity on our work what then happens if we become unemployed? What happens if we become underemployed? If we can't do what we've been trained to do? Well, it's easy to be depressed. It's all too common. So I, what I'd like you to do is I'd like all of you to repeat after me this truth. I am not my work. Say it with me. I am not my work. That's not who you are. Another way that you can build your identity is around your ideology or your preferences. But here's the deal. We are not our ideology or our preferences. Thanks be to God. Okay, so I was, I was young and stupid, and uh, I was in college. And uh, at that time, I was studying political philosophy, and uh, <coughs> I was enamored, you know, at the Kremlin on the Charles with socialism. And uh, by age 20, I literally thought of myself as part of the vanguard of the proletariat. I was about as bourgeois as they come, and I was <laughs> the vanguard of the proletariat? Give me a break! But by the time I reached age 21, I, <coughs> I was now older and wiser. I became a democratic socialist, okay? <coughs> and, and trust me, um, even though Bernie is making that popular now, it was not popular back then. <laughs> the older I get, the more conservative I find I'm becoming as the culture moves relentlessly leftward. Then I met Jesus again, this time as Lord. And since then, I've found my identity in him. But if I continue to base my identity on my political understanding or identification with a political movement, I would be continually disappointed. How many of you out there read, keep up with the news, the blogs, you know, how many of you do that? Okay, here's the deal. I'm, I'm actually glad to hear that a lot of you don't do that uh, because there's a danger in it. I mean, I moved to Washington area to change the world. It was all that. Was, and so I'm still interested in this stuff, okay? It's a vexation to me. But uh, um, I've noticed that most political junkies are continually disappointed. You know, if you pay attention to this stuff, it's like, oh, they're doing it wrong, and oh, I can't believe this is happening, and oh, and this is what it is. It's basically most political blogs are, are variations on the theme of ain't it awful, right? <laughs> Denominations rise and fall and regroup. What's stable in this life? Some people define themselves by their preferences in leisure activities or consumer choices. You know, some people say, oh, you know, I'm a skier. I'm a gamer. Or how about, I'm a vegan. <laughs> how about you? iPhone or Android? Hockey fan or basketball fan in the winter and spring? Please repeat after me. I am not my ideology or preferences. I am not my ideology or preferences. Now, the most subtle of deceptions in this area, I think, about our identity is this. We often try to build our identity around our relationships with people. But we are not our relationships with people. The truth is, relationships change. Families change. We change. Husbands, <coughs> without exception, expand our waistlines. Sometimes we're not as attentive as we once were, and we lose hair in some places, <laughs> and we gain it in others. 
Wives lose their girlish figures, sometimes are not as attentive as they once were, and their hair seems to get more and more expensive over time. <laughs> we had a joke in my <coughs> family um, with our kids, you know, Pastor Salvi and all that with kids growing up, and, and uh, you know, one of our sons would say, well, you know, uh, can't we go to Disney World or whatever the thing was, right? And we had this kind of standing joke in the family. I mean, they knew it was a joke, okay? Um, but I, I said to them at one point, I said, we can't go to Disney World because your mom colors her hair. <laughs> okay, so that became the standing answer to anything that we couldn't afford. It was, no, mom colors her hair. We can't, <laughs> can't do that. People change. Sometime a, a close friend will cut you off. Sometimes a fiance will dump you. Sometimes your spouse will dump you. Sometimes someone really close to you dies. Our children change, and children eventually leave home. At least, well, that's the plan, isn't it? <laughs> if our identity is built on our children, then when they leave home, we can feel like our purpose in life is over. People who find identity, I mean, you know, people, it's crazy the way people find their identity. It's like people are now finding their identity in where their child goes to college. Can I get a witness? They find their identity in what their child's job is. People find their identity in their grandchildren. These are all good things. They're not bad things, beloved. But these things are passing away. These things change. These things are nothing to build a stable identity around. And the reason it's such a deception is that our relations with people are Really, really important to God. Remember, <laughs> Jesus said, there's two things you got to know. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. And then you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, our relations with other people are really important to God. But even our family, even our relationships with other people can become idols. Your husband or your wife can be an idol in your life. Christians talk about family values, and Jesus said, who is my mother, who is my brother? It's the one who follows me. Say it with me. I am not my relationships with other people. I am not my relationships with other people. So if we have work, but we're not our work. We have ideologies and preferences, but we're not our ideologies or preferences, right? We have relations with other people, but we are not our relations with other people. Then who are we? Well, for answers, open your Red Pew Bible to page 1241, Ephesians chapter 1. We're just going to walk through Ephesians. We're going to spend uh, more than a couple of months here. In verse 1, the Apostle Paul answers that question with this good news. He writes to the saints in Ephesus, to the faithful in Jesus Christ. And then he goes on. And in the rest of this first chapter, he lists the most amazing blessings that we have because we are in Christ. We are adopted into his family. Oh, my the good news of the gospel is that your primary identity is in Jesus Christ. And beloved, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can I hear an amen? amen. That is a stable identity for you forever. Jesus will never leave you. He won't forsake you. You are safe. You are protected from idolatry. You are in the place that God has created you to be when he is where you find your identity. You're accepted in the beloved, verse 1. And the beloved here is referring to Jesus. 
God's only begotten son. We are sons of God, but Jesus is God's only begotten son. It's similar, but not the same. Our core identity is found in relationship properly, but only in relationship with God. He's our father, and we are adopted as his sons. Yes, as sons. I'm going to explain that later. As sons of God, Paul says that right now, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Think about that. Right now, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Look at the text. We have forgiveness of sins, verse 7. Verse 8, we have all wisdom and understanding. What? We have the grace and the power of God freely lavished on us. We have the promised Holy Spirit, verse 19. We have been given incomparably great power, the same power that raised Jesus and can raise you and me to new life. All of this you inherit when you're adopted by God. So, beloved, as we prepare to walk through the, the, the letter to the Ephesians, I want to ask you, today, please do it today, read through the entire letter of Ephesians. It's only six chapters. It'll probably take you ten minutes, okay? Read the whole letter. And then what I'd like you to do is, every day this week, just go back, please, and read chapter one. Just go back and read chapter one through every day day this week, if you meditate on this, if you can really own more solidly the blessings that you've been given in Christ, it'll change your life. Point number two, your identity is that you are adopted by the Father. You are adopted by the Father. Paul says, verse five, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. Hmm. Did you get that? God adopted you because it makes him happy. It pleases him to bring you into his family. He wanted you in his family from before you were born. Adoption is a huge concept that, beloved, I really want you to get it, so we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about what adoption means today. There's a, a marvelous Reformed theologian who happens to be an Anglican in our denomination named J.I. Packer, and he wrote a great book called uh, Knowing God and many other things, but he says, and I agree with him, that probably the most important metaphor in the Bible about our salvation is this metaphor of adoption. It's the most powerful metaphor of all, and we're going to explore why I think that is this morning. Now, it's important that we, we get ourselves into the mindset of the Greek culture with a Roman overlay of Paul's day in Ephesus in the first century. He's writing to a culture that abandoned children regularly. I mean, really abandoned. It's an abandonment culture that he's writing to. How many of you remember reading the play Oedipus Rex in high school? Anybody read Oedipus Rex? Well, <clears throat> I read it, and um, and I you know I don't expect you to remember all, <laughs> all of it, but you know, great Greek play by Aeschylus. And here's here's the thing. Okay, so Oedipus is a king. And he and his, and his wife, the queen, is pregnant. And there's an oracle, okay, this is all Greek culture, there's nothing to do with, with uh, prophetic Hebrew prophets or anything, but this oracle prophesized that this child in her womb is going to one day kill his father and marry his mother, okay? This is twisted Greek stuff, all right? But it's, it's what it is, all right? And so what the king does is, is a very common thing in that day. The king decides, oh, I know how I'm going to fix this problem. I'm going to take the child, and I'm going to, to leave him and abandon him, right, and just let him be out in the elements to die of exposure, or, you know, let, let, let the gods figure it out, right? Well, <coughs> that play 
would have been shown in the great theater of, of Ephesus, which this is a picture of. This theater sat 40,000 people, which was, wasn't the largest, but one of the largest outdoor amphitheaters in the world at the time. You see, this is, in, this is consistent with Roman law at the time. When a Roman baby was born, <coughs> it would be placed at the feet of the father and the father would inspect the child. If there was a defect in the child, if the child, if he wanted a boy, but he got a girl, if he got a girl but wanted a boy, if, you know, he was just done with having children, if he was in a bad mood that day, it didn't really matter, he had the right to have the, ch the child taken away and abandoned. It's the abandonment culture. The abandoned baby wouldn't be killed immediately, but it would be left either in the marketplace or in a field. Sometimes Romans would pick up an abandoned baby to be raised as a slave or a prostitute to serve the family. One of the things that set apart the new Christian community was that they actually adopted these ones as their own children. They took them into their family as their own children. It's one of the reasons the church grew in the early centuries. <coughs> Paul is writing to these people. Many of them are slaves when he's writing. Many of them used to be slaves, right? And he says, when you came to know Jesus, what defines you now is not who threw you out, but who took you in. Jesus picked you out, he picked you up, and he took you home to be with him forever. In Greek, the word adoption Paul's using here is the word <coughs> huiothesia. Now, thesia means to make something, and huios is son. So literally, adoption means to make you a son. Now, in Hebrew culture, adoption was unknown. I mean, you know, in, in the Old Testament, you have leave right marriage, but that's not anything like adoption. It was a specific legal procedure in the Roman world. And Paul knows about this because he's a Roman citizen. And, and in order to understand what this means that we're adopted into his family, you need to understand what was involved in this procedure. <coughs> so a rich Roman man who had no male heir would adopt a fully grown man as his son. The reason that he needed to do this was he didn't want to see, I mean, he wanted to have a legacy, right? And the problem was that in the Roman, under Roman law, women couldn't inherit. So he needed a male heir. <coughs> and he didn't want his estate to be broken up. So he would find a worthy young man, adopt him, and several, th three things would happen as soon as he was adopted. First, all of the new son's old obligations and debts were canceled because the father assumes them. Second, the son becomes as wealthy as his father. In other words, the heir of everything the father has. It's really the point of adoption is to create an heir. And third, the son now has responsibility of carrying on and honoring the family name of his father. Now, the adoption, this use of this adoption language by Paul is <coughs> shows us that we aren't children of God by nature. Adoption takes a legal proceeding initiated by the Father in order to be effective. So to say, as some people do, <coughs> that we're all children of God, all of us, you know, have God our Father, Christ our brother, and all of that, that is actually diametrically opposed to what the scriptures actually say. Only through Christ, at Christ's expense, through the redemption of his blood, verse 7, can anyone be adopted. And the only reason that you're in the family is because of your redemption by the blood of Christ and because God sovereignly chose from before the foundation of the universe, he sovereignly chose you to be in his family. He actually wanted you. He knew all about you. And he wanted you anyway in his family. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 says, 
Oh, let's put that on the screen. I'd like you to read it with me. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become sons of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh, but of God. You see that? It's those who believed in his name, that Jesus is the Christ. They are the children of God. You know, in real life adoption today, sometimes the birth mother or the birth father will come back and try to take the biological child back. Um, you know, when we adopted, our two sons are adopted, uh, the law at the time said that the birth mother and the birth mother actually had a year to change their mind, okay? Kind of wait on tenterhooks until that, is, that period is over. Well, that, that particular thing doesn't happen a lot, but it happens sometimes. And I want you to know this morning that if you are a son of our Heavenly Father, it will happen to you. Your old family, the family you were taken away from, the forces of darkness, will definitely come to you from time to time and whisper doubts like this into your mind. Are you really an adopted son of God? When the father doesn't do things the way you want him to do in your life or in the timing that you feel like you need him to do, sometimes you'll hear a voice that says something like this, what kind of a father would allow this to happen? Or when you fail, you might hear a voice that says, you call yourself a Christian. How could the father love you after You've done what you've done. That is the forces of darkness. That's your old family. That's the old DNA trying to stick a wedge between you and your new adoptive father in heaven. Paul uses the term sons to describe the new identity of both men and women. Now, some people might say, you know, what about this? I mean, I don't relate to this language of, you know, being adopted as sons. I'm a woman. Am I excluded? Well, actually, no, precisely the opposite. Because it looks like exclusionary language, some of the newer translations will say sons and daughters or children instead of sons. But what's happening is when they do that, you lose the understanding of the legal thing that what Paul was trying to say in the passage. Because at the time, women could not inherit. And so when Paul says you're all sons, he's being radical and subversive. And he is saying that gender is irrelevant when it comes to inheriting all of the blessings of the kingdom of God. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's what he's saying. So yes, in that sense, we're all sons. That's the proper biblical metaphor we all inherit. Both sons and daughters inherit all the benefits mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1. Point number three. <clears throat> Father God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Now, I know this is really difficult to believe. <laughs> <laughs> but hang in there with me, okay? The father cannot love the son less than he loves, less, love you less than he loves his only begotten son. Look at John 17, 23. It says, Father, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Father, you love them just as you have loved me. This is Jesus speaking. Take that in. When Christ says that, when you ever even see the word adoption, this must mean he loves everybody in this room who has really received him as Savior as much as he loves his only begotten Son. God the Father loves you with the same kind of everlasting love. He has the same joy over you that he has over his Son, Jesus. He has the same commitment to you as he has to Jesus. Jesus said so. In Romans 8, it says, all creation is groaning and waiting for us to be liberated to come into the glorious freedom of the sons of God. 
Then Paul says, we too groan for our adoption, the redeeming of our bodies. What is this about? Okay, so in Ephesians 1, Paul is saying we are adopted right now. In Romans 8, Paul is saying there will come a time in which we're adopted in an even more full way. That is at the end of all days. <clears throat> so this. When I adopt a child, you and I adopt a child, we give that child everything. We gave Will and Sam everything. The whole point of adoption is you love your adopted child just as much as you love a child that springs from your own loins, right? But there's one thing you can't give an adopted child in the natural, and that is your DNA, right? You can't give them your chromosomes. That already came from their biological parents. But the Bible tells us that our Heavenly Father has given us a new DNA. We are born again. Remember what I preached last week? We are born again we, because our spirits were dead and God came and injected his DNA in us and he gave us his spirit and so our spirit is now merged with his spirit and it's alive. And he's saying that that's just the beginning. Huh. He's saying that at the end of days, our Heavenly Father is going to give us even more of his DNA because his glory is going to drop on us. His inheritance is going to be completely given to us. His nature is going to fall on you and me, and we are going to be like him. We're finally going to lose all our flaws. We're going to finally look like Jesus does with all his integrity, all his wisdom, and all his love. And here's the mind-boggling thing. This is really, this boggles my mind. On the last day, the glory of our sonship, the fact of our transformation is going to be so great that when it happens, it's going to transform the whole universe at the same time. The universe is longing for our liberation as the sons of God. Our own transformation is going to be so great, it's going to subsume all of creation and glorify it. So not only will our bodies no longer decay, the earth, the new heaven and new earth will never decay. All of this is wrapped up in our sonship, in our adoption. It means there's nothing higher, nothing greater than being admitted to the family of God. I think we have only begun to scratch the surface of what we're actually going to get when the inheritance of God falls on us. So in conclusion, remember who you are. By virtue of your faith in Christ, you're a child of the king. The, the Christian life starts with adoption, not with behavior. You are accepted in the beloved. God will never leave you nor forsake you. And there's a, there's a phrase in the adoption community. I don't know if you've heard this before, but I'm going to say it over you. Um, because it speaks of your um, identification with the family of God, and that's this. You are in God's forever family. Amen.